In this video, I'm gonna share the three biggest mistakes that I've made with my photography over the last 40 odd years. And the third one in particular has been quite significant or correcting it has been quite significant. About 12 years ago, I wrote a book called To Live For. It was essentially a collection of stories around the things that have taken turns saving my life or more accurately, uh, give me something to live for. Now, I never published that book because of the same three mistakes that I've been making with my photography ever since I picked up a camera 42 odd years ago. Thankfully, I've recently addressed all three of them and, well, it's changed my life. So if you've been making these same three mistakes, this is perhaps an opportunity for you to change yours too. If you're new here, my name is Peter. I'm an ex-pro photographer. I shot for car and motorcycle magazines for many, many years, but I now consider myself to be a reforming workaholic who uses my true love of uh, landscape photography as an excuse, as sort of permission to get outside and de-stress and enjoy my time in nature with a camera in hand. Now, the first big mistake I made was worrying how others might judge my work. Um, now, in a commercial setting, that makes perfect sense. After all, people are paying you for a result. But in a personal setting, when you're doing photography purely for the pleasure of it, it makes no sense at all to be concerned about how others are going to judge your work. Stephen Pressfield, one of my favourite authors, has written a number of books on what he calls finding your muse and creating art that matters to you. Those books include uh, The War of Art, Do the Work, Turning Pro, uh, and one of my personal favourites, um, Nobody Wants to Read Your Shit. And that book really speaks to this issue of worrying how others might judge your work because at the end of the day, nobody really cares about your work anywhere near as much as you do. Really, you should be shooting first and foremost for you. The paradox, of course, is that everybody judges everybody else. I mean, we all do it. You do it, I do it. Our brains are effectively a judgment engine. They're constantly examining everything around us and deciding, is this safe? Is this dangerous? Is this tasty? Is it repulsive? Is this attractive? Is it ugly? Is it appealing? Is it not? Is it something I want? Is it something that I don't want? So we're constantly judging whether we like it or not. So wishing that people didn't judge our work is genuinely a waste of energy because we all do it. And paradoxically, nobody really cares that much anyway. The thing is, once you forget about the fear of judgment, it frees you to do whatever you like. You can experiment until your heart's content, which is wonderful. It's incredibly liberating to finally realize that it doesn't really matter what anybody thinks of your photography, whether you keep it private or whether you display it publicly on, on YouTube or on Instagram or any other platform, it really doesn't matter what others think. So long as you're shooting for you and you're enjoying it, that's all that matters. It also eliminates one of life's biggest causes of stress and that is worrying what others think. It's why people spend too much on a house, a car, on fancy gear, on clothes, on you know fancy restaurants. A lot of this has to do with caring what others will think of us. And best of all, not concerning yourself with these imaginary judges that we've built up in our mind is it brings control back to you, the artist. The second mistake I made, and some would not deem this to be a mistake, but for me, I think it was because it was severely limiting, is relying purely on documenting versus creating or storytelling with my images. So the mistake I was making was purely documenting what I saw. And there are a few problems with that. First off, we all see things very differently. So trying to you know, accurately portray what we see is going to be fraught because we see things differently. Secondly, we all see things in three dimensions and our experience of a place is augmented by smell, sound, touch, temperature, um, and the mood that we we're in on the day. So, you know, it's very, very hard to convey that in flat two-dimensional form, which of course is how our camera rep records things. So at the very best, our camera is delivering a heavily diluted version of what we experienced in any one situation. And the third thing is that any scene comprises a number of elements, and it's usually those individual elements that appeal to us. You know, it could be a lone tree on a hill, could be um, the way the light is striking a rock face, uh, the way the fog is flowing down a valley. All of these things um, contribute to how we see a particular scene out in front of us. So when we approach a scene and um, we're attracted to these different elements, if we include all of them in our image, it can be very hard for the viewer to decide where to direct their attention. Once I started to um, focus on specific elements and then amplify those, and diminish the impact of the, or eliminate completely, the impact of the other ones around it. Well then, it produced much stronger images and told better stories. Um, 
And the best thing, of course, is that when you approach a scene and you focus on individual elements within the scene, it creates multiple image opportunities. It also means you don't have to travel very far to get interesting photos. You don't have to go to those exotic locations, which we all yearn for, of course. Um, you can get very interesting images in what would otherwise be considered mundane locations because you have developed this um, affinity with individual elements within the scene and you can see creative images within um, an otherwise ordinary scene. Uh, and that means, of course, that you can shoot closer to home and you can shoot more often. So there's a lot of benefits to it. The third mistake I was making, and like I said, this was a big one for me, was I was linking the pleasure I got from landscape photography to the outcome, in other words, to the images. And if I went out in a shoot one day and I didn't get what I considered to be amazing images, then the whole experience fell flat. There's that old saying that we all know that if you do what you love for a living, then you'll never work a day in your life. And this kind of speaks to this issue because I think the same is true for success and happiness. It's not in the arriving, it's in the doing. That's how you achieve success and happiness in life is to appreciate the whole process of whatever it is that you're doing. That way you can be happy and you can be successful all the time. Neither of those things are dependent on outcomes, on destinations, on arriving at a point that you have determined out into the future. So, you know, if you find yourself saying, um, I'd be happy with my photography if, or I'll be able to call myself a successful landscape photographer when, then, you know, this change in approach to how you view um, where you get your pleasure from in landscape photography can dramatically impact um, the satisfaction you get from it. I made the same mistake for quite a long time. And eventually I remembered the lessons that I'd learned as a photographer in the early days of experimenting um, for car magazines, as well as my writing, uh, blogging, podcasting, and you know, being an investor, a father, all these sorts of things. I remember that there were three important things to consider about this whole thing. And one was that I would never reach a point where I was the expert. On something. It was just impossible to ever become number one um, in the world on something. Uh, I could become the best at something in my area or in my company or whatever, but you know, there was always room for evolution and improvement. <clears throat> Second thing I realized was that I will always know more about something than someone else. So no matter where you come to a topic in terms of your expertise and your experience, you will know more about it than somebody else who may want to learn from you. And so when I realized that both of those things are always true, I can never be the top expert and I will always know more than some people, then it gave me permission to just enjoy the process of experimenting, learning, screwing up um, and sharing, you know, what I'm learning and what I'm, the mistakes that I'm making along the way. Um, so I, I, I got to enjoy all of it thereby making me successful all of the time. <laughs> you know, the first gold record for the spoken word was recorded in 1956 by a guy called Earl Nightingale. And the recording was called The Stranger's Secret. And in it, he said that the best definition of success that he could come up with was that it was the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. He said that if a person is um, working towards a predetermined goal, then that person is a success. He didn't say that if a person had reached a predetermined goal, they were a success, but that if they were working toward it, they were a success. And by virtue of that definition, simply progressing in your craft, simply getting out there and practicing your craft and enjoying it, made you successful. It makes you successful because you are progressively realizing a worthy ideal. And worthy ideal also doesn't mean a specific measurable, tangible goal. It just means whatever you deem to be worthy, whatever you decide is an ideal um, sort of direction to be heading in, as you're moving towards it, you're successful. Now your goal might be to win a landscape photography competition. It might be to create 12 brilliant images a year, which is a difficult but worthy goal for sure. It might be like me to simply get out once a week to immerse yourself in nature with your camera in hand. Whatever your goal is, if you can shift your focus towards making the process the source of your pleasure versus an arbitrary destination way out in the distance, 
then you can be happy doing landscape photography. And you can, as a byproduct of that, get much better at landscape photography much more easily with less friction. It's kind of ironic that when we are so attached to an outcome, it eludes us. But as soon as we kind of release ourselves from that attachment, then success and the things that we saw tend to come easier. Uh, this is why people who uh, start to become successful tend to continue to become successful because they settle into this uh, sort of pace of expecting things to work out because they have clear evidence in the immediate past of things working out for them. And so they tend to continue to become successful because they settle into it, they become comfortable with it, they're less anxious about it, they enjoy it more. Um, and that's why people who um, really enjoy what they do tend to become successful at it because they're not stressed and anxious about outcomes, they're just enjoying it. Since I've corrected these mistakes, I'm much happier with um, my photography. I enjoy it so much more. I'm free to create whatever I like, however I like, and I'm, I'm no longer stressed about the outcomes at all. I often say that, um, you know, the real goal of landscape photography is just simply to get outside and the images are the icing on the cake. You know, if I get good images, great. If I don't, I don't give a crap, <laughs> you know. I got outside with my camera. I enjoyed being immersed in nature. That's, that's really all I wanted. Hopefully this has been helpful to you. Now head over to this video here where I share how to get at least five great images from the one location without moving, which kind of speaks to point number two in this video. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for hanging out with me again. Hopefully you got something out of this. If you're not subscribed, I'd certainly love to have you along and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.